Bill, over to you. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to turn off my camera a moment because um, one of these things that happens to people, I get, uh, I've got um, central vision loss, so I need to get very close to my screen. So rather than being distracted by seeing me getting moving around and getting close, I shall just turn my camera off, and then we'll we'll get on with the uh, with the video, with the with the lecture. Sorry. Okay, so oh, if things move, why is that? Sorry, there we go. Sorry, yep. Yeah. So these are the questions that I'm hoping to answer this evening. Um, really trying to relate the, the future of EVs to someone living in, in the Romsey area or in a small town rather than being in a big city. So I'm not going to talk about public transport. I'm going to talk mainly about um, the implications on small vehicles um, and really look through the whole subject as best I can. This is a kind of a primer on EVs, really, if you uh, there's quite a lot of lot of subjects to go through, but um, I think if you understand this and you you can remember some of this lecture, it'll be quite a good primer when you come to buy your first EV, hopefully anyway. <laughs> but uh, then that should will probably not be too far in the future, I don't think. So anyway, here we go. So right. So some time ago, John gave us a talk. Um, John Gould, our uh, chairman this evening, gave us a talk on the the change in the climate and. He showed us the, the graph above where we can see temperature inexorably heading upwards and CO2 levels, which are doing the same and obviously are the, are the, are going to become um, agreed as, as being the cause, the main cause of, of, uh, of global warming. He also showed us this picture here, which showed the various impacts, you know, all the various uh, parameters which are affecting the climate. And really this evening we're looking at uh, the human impact, which is transport and other and other matters, but mainly concentrating on transport. We've agreed, sorry, the UK um, has, uh, has agreed to to um, cut our emissions substantially. And um, I think in the in the whole topic of emissions and whether um, whether, we, whether people agree to actually cut their emissions or stay the same. I think there have been some angels and demons. We've certainly got an angel in the corner there with Greta Thunberg. Some very interesting programmes on BBC just recently about her and uh, a, a commitment to the subject. And on the other hand, we've got these uh, people like this who have just been making sure that nothing happens really. And that's it's, it's, it's a great shame because Kyoto was agreed sometime in the late 90s and we've had 25 years of really not a lot happening apart from scientists agreeing that uh, things should happen. So we now have the, the, the government has agreed, um, has signed us up to 78% reduction of uh, greenhouse gases by 2035 and that's really not a long time in the future when you think about it. We've got A lot has got to happen now very very quickly. Just looking as to where the, all the greenhouse gases are coming from, you can see on the left hand side there, transport is, is the biggest um, uh, thing in the UK at the moment. It accounts for probably 28% of greenhouse gases in the UK. This substantially is because our, most of our major industries have, have, have left us, um, really. But um, and, and of course, we don't count the import, you know, the, the effects of um, imported goods into this, into this total so it's a bit of a shame but so we're going to concentrate on transport of, which I say accounts for probably something like 28 percent I'm seeing a figure of 40 percent quoted elsewhere but I suspect that also includes shipping and uh, air transport but 28 um, percent accounts for road transports of all types in the UK um, these figures here show us that the the small vehicles taxis account for 20 percent of the whole total, so so, so of that twenty eight percent, the the twenty percent of that of the total, the, the full total is um, small vehicles. So it's it's a big change. You know, by decarbonising small vehicles, we'll make a very large change to um, our greenhouse gas outputs. Who remembers the good old days when you could actually advertise petrol? You know, that was, <laughs> I don't know, that stuck in my mind from when I was a child somehow, get a tiger in your tank. And 
the big big question is why are um, why are fossil fuels just so hard to give up? And if we look at this um, chart here, which uh, and I've just blown it up on, so on the screen, so we see this bigger here, this bar chart, we can see that fossil fuels uh, compared to the the bottom ones, the the green ones at the bottom there. Um, the energy available from fossil fuels is just so much higher than equivalent green green energy sources, and even accounting for efficiency, then well, it's, efficiency really is, is the saving grace. If you look at the efficiency on the left hand side, which is the best possible um, efficiency we can get from a diesel engine and a petrol engine and so on. Um, the only saving grace is that our, our modern technologies are much, much more efficient, more like 80, 90% if, when they're running correctly. So even so, we bring it back to the, the original graph. It's still very difficult at the, at the present time for our green technologies to compete with fossil fuels because the, the convenience and, uh, of fossil fuels is so enormous. I think what occurs to me really is that if the if the world had an exhaust pipe, then we'd carry on using them very happily, and there'd be very little competition. Um, but the, but sadly, the world doesn't have an exhaust pipe, and we're now suffering the the effects of the of the fuel. Uh, sorry, the, the greenhouse gases building up in our atmosphere. Electric vehicles have been around for a very long time. This is going back to 1890, and just 10 years later, at the turn of the century, 1900. And approximately all, a third of, of all vehicles at that time were actually electric. Um, I guess a third were, roughly a third were, were internal combustion engine, probably a third was steam. Um, and it wasn't until really 1919 or thereabouts when Ford introduced the starter motor into um, into fairly cheap vehicles that uh, that made the big difference. I do apologise to our lady ladies watching at the bottom left hand corner. Um, it's a rather misogynistic view, but um, it was it was a real thing because starting an engine at that time would require a starting handle, and not only did it require considerable strength, and then you got greasy actually doing it, and there was considerable risk of, of, of injury because the engine could backfire um, and, uh, and, and cause quite, uh, quite bad injuries. So the, the, in, the advent of the starter motor, people say, in reality, is, is when the petrol engine became a much more acceptable way forward. And, um, and that's, that's why petrol engines from, from this sort of time for domestic vehicles became the dominant, um, you know, the dominant type of vehicle. And of course, as we looked at in previous graphs, then the, the energy density as well of, of the fuel was, was much higher. And it was a very convenient way to run a, run a small vehicle. How many people have run out of petrol? We, we did it once and it wasn't a very nice experience. Everybody is, is worried about this. Now, whether this is because of lobbying um, due to the, you know, the petrol industries, et cetera, I don't know. But it is a, it is a real anxiety amongst people. And it's probably something I need, I need to talk about this evening in terms of just how real is that, uh, is that danger. So one of the ways of, around the, uh, the range anxiety problem that, uh, that the petrol manufacturers have, uh, you know, sorry, the, the car manufacturers have, have advocated is the hybrid. And although they, they do give um, greater range, et cetera, um, it's really a dead end technology because the, they've been outlawed as from 19, sorry, 2035 anyway. And um, they, they, they don't really deliver the performance that you might expect. They, they tend to, you just tend to end up with a much larger vehicle, um, the, the great big sort of uh, SUV gus guzzlers that we see um, with a, a green credential, which is not really realistic. So I, I'm, not, I'm not a great fan of hybrids at all, to be honest with you. Um, so this really offers us two ways forward at this time for, you know, for green transport. One is hydrogen. And a lot of people are advocates of that. And the other really is a lithium ion battery, which is, um, which is what I'm going to talk about after. But I'll, I'll talk about hydrogen first, just so we can take a look at that and see how realistic it is um, as, a, as, a, as a fuel for, for, for transport. If we use hydrogen, then what we would tend to do is to use what's on the right hand side there, a fuel cell, which, which is a, um, a 
a catalytic conversion really or from the hydrogen to electricity. Uh, again, it, it does oxidize the hydrogen and the output is water. We could use an internal combustion engine as seen on the left hand side, but, it, but internal combustion engine, engines are very inefficient and the, the fuel cell is more like 60% compared to probably like 25% for, uh, for the internal combustion engine. So, so all, ve all hydrogen vehicles will use a fuel cell or the vast majority anyway. This is the, how a car would put together very roughly for the, with a hydrogen um, tank at the back there. Um, normally the tank would contain either liquid hydrogen, which has to be cryogenically stored, or high pressure hydrogen. High pressure hydrogen is probably the way forward for most, and it can be kept for longer. But it does require an incredibly strong tank. I think the pressure is something like 10,000 PSI for high pressure hydrogen. At, uh, at normal, normal temperatures. Um, that is then passed into a fuel cell, which provides the electricity to drive the motor. I don't know if you've heard of how hydrogen is produced, but um, it's, it generally comes at the moment, it comes in two types, either called, they call gray hydrogen or blue hydrogen. And both of those are, are hydrogen formed by steam in a steam reformer. Um, where methane typically is converted with steam uh, under high pressure and uh, with, a, with a catalyst into hydrogen. But the problem is that one ton of hydrogen results in 11 tons of CO2 being produced. Grey hydrogen means that CO2 is simply vented into the atmosphere, whereas blue hydrogen requires that hydrogen, that, that CO2 rather, to be sequestered and, um, and dealt with in some way. Now, as far as I'm aware, and as far as I could check on the internet at the moment, there, there are no um, sequestering plants running at industrial scale in the world, I don't, I don't believe at the moment. I may be wrong, but that's what I seem to find. So, so the blue hydrogen remains a sort of future prospect. And the vast majority of hydrogen produced these days um, by normal means is gray hydrogen. So the output of CO2 is quite colossal. To produce blue, sorry, produce green hydrogen, then normally this involves an um, electrolytic conversion where, where electricity is converted, sorry, electricity is used to convert water into its constituent gases of hydrogen and oxygen. The big problem is the amount of electricity which is required because if you look in what's highlighted in the bottom corner there, although hydrogen itself in terms of um, kilograms, it's got a, a fairly high uh, energy density of about 33.4 kilowatt hours per kilogram. You've, the conversion process is probably only 70%, maybe 80% efficient. And the compression of the gas takes a lot of energy and is uh, results in a 50% efficiency. So overall, that means that you for a kilogram of hydrogen, you're looking at something like 88, um, I think that's right. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, 80, 83 kilowatt hours of electricity to deliver only 33 kilowatt hours at the, uh, the, at the uh, output. So that's a bit of a problem. If we look at that in terms of what it means in, in, the, in, the, in renewable, en renewable energy, then essentially the overall conversion from renewable energy to the motor in the, in the car is has an efficiency of only about 22%. Whereas if we compare that to lithium iron, we're much higher, it's something like about 69% typically. Um, all of these figures, you know, are, are really fingers in the air numbers, but they're, but they're not, not too, too far out. The net result is that if we were to run hydrogen for the same, you know, for the same number of vehicles and the same number of miles, you'd require three times the amount of, um, of renewable energy. In other words, three times the number of windmills. Hydrogen, however, does have a future. Um, California have gone into hydrogen in a big way, and um, I guess that's because they were they were in trying to get away from using fuel um, fossil fuels early on before lithium ion became fairly dominant in the area. Um, so they do have a, a good uh, distribution network for um, hydrogen, um, and you can go to a petrol effectively a petrol station, a fuel station, and fill up your car with hydrogen. It has the advantage of the refueling process is quite fast and you can preserve the range of vehicles quite well using high pressure hydrogen. 
Also, it's probably got a future for heavy goods vehicles. Um, heavy goods vehicles are, are, can carry a much bigger tank. They can carry heavy, pro, you know, heavy plant on them, such as the the fuel cell, etc. Um, and they and they want long. They, they need long range you know, to be able to, you know, as well as fast refueling. So, so all those factors kind of push towards hydrogen for that. There's a possibility that hydrogen might might be useful for might be usable rather for um, domestic uh, commercial sorry commercial airline and uh, a number of airlines are sorry airplane manufacturers are looking at uh, this as a prospect at the moment. Um, in addition, there are some some prospects for using hydrogen to manufacture steel, although I believe the the major problem there is just the sheer amount of hydrogen required. And I did see a figure somewhere that one ton of steel would require something like three or four tons of hydrogen, um, which is, again, is if you go back to the sort of one kilogram requiring 88 kilowatt hours, 83 kilowatt hours, is pretty scary, the amount of electricity that would be required to, to make that work. I put this in for my friend Stuart, who's mad about trams. And this is a, this is a, a, a hydrogen powered tram in South Korea. Um, Stuart travels the world looking at trams, so perhaps his next holiday will be in South Korea. I don't, I'm not sure. I shall find out, I'm sure. The lithium-ion battery is, is, uh, is shown here in its, uh, in its very basic and elementary form. And what happens is that uh, as you push, push electricity into the battery, then lithium ions are forced from the cathode on the left-hand side to the anode on the right. Um, and they, they lodge in a graphite matrix, effectively. Now, you have to look at the, um, the lithium-ion battery as a system. And it's unfair to think of, the, think of how your phone performs and the fact that, it, you know, after 18 months, it's dead. Because you can, material scientists are able to reconfigure batteries in different ways by using different product, different, um, different, uh, anode and, and cathode materials etc to make the battery either have a long life or high capacity and, and those things can be traded off to some extent of course what we don't want is both really but and, and that's what people work is to to find the best way of producing the, the maximum possible life with the highest possible uh, energy capacity lithium resources around the world are shown here um, most of the lithium these days actually comes from South America. I didn't realize this until recently, but there are some lakes, um, dried up lakes high in the mountains, the salt flats, which have quite a high uh, lithium, capacity, um, lithium uh, proportion. You also see that uh, there's lithium in Cornwall. And if you look up the um, Cornwall Lithium Company, I think you'll find there's, uh, there's prospects of using um, a, it's a um, thermal, thermal energy system by where water's passed into the ground and, they, and they're looking at how it pulls the minerals out and, they, and I guess the water contains lithium which they can then extract. Looking worldwide at where the lithium is, then Chile has most of it. Australia's got quite a lot and close behind is Argentina with China not uh, not too far behind. So um, the graph on the right is interesting in the sense that we can see that despite the requirement for lithium increasing, the price is actually dropping. And I guess that's due to plants coming online. Um, in other words, the manufacturing cap capacity for lithium is increasing, um, allowing the price to, to reduce. In a lithium-based car, lithium-ion-based car, then there's actually quite a lot of electronics which is required to keep the lithium under control. So you've got a, obviously got a, um, a processor unit at the top there, which is the, you know, the control unit. Um, you've got a charger, you then got a fuel gauge, which has to measure the amount of, amount of energy that goes into the battery and the amount of energy that comes out. And then of course, you've got the, um, the control circuitry there at the bottom, which controls the energy into the motor. So you, as you put your foot in the accelerator, uh, that's what that's what controls that uh, particular process to make the, the motor go faster. If this system doesn't work very well, and we you need the cooling system as well for when it's char fast charging and when it's discharging at high rates, things can go wrong, and uh, the net result can be uh, that which is rather 
disastrous and upsetting if it's your car. Most, actually, most car manufacturers now, and this is what I'm trying to show here, is that most car manufacturers are now producing lithium ion based vehicles. There's a very, very wide range already available, and the, the market um, choice really is set to increase quite dramatically over the next few years, with, with I think pretty well everybody coming in on this, uh, on this technology. This shows the manufacturers by, by volume. Um, so Tesla, uh, well in the lead, with VW coming not far behind. VW invested greatly in, um, in EVs. Um, really to try and rescue their, their green credentials with their disastrous uh, problems they've had with their, their diesel, you know, diesel gate effectively. The third one down is interesting. Who's ever heard of SAIC, I wonder? And this might give us a bit of a clue. It's the Shanghai Automobile Company. Um, I think the, the Chinese are coming, really. Uh, the, the ability to manufacture is quite awesome. And at the moment, they're dealing with their internal demand, and um, which is which again is huge in the, in the in the country of China itself. But I think that there's a very big opportunity for the Chinese manufacturers to come into the into the West with low power, sorry, low cost vehicles. And I would not be surprised at all if we look at this chart in a few years' time, and they and they are well up towards the top. Oops, where's that gone? Right, well, I'm going backwards, sorry. Go forwards again, there we are. Um, I don't know if anybody heard about the Dyson proposal to, uh, or Dyson's proposal, I should say, James Dyson's proposal to introduce a car. He got as far as a, proto a prototype. And the story is that he invested 500 million pound of his own money into the, into the prototype. Um, in the end, he decided the cost was going to be 150,000, and it was just too much for the market. He, he couldn't then invest; it wasn't, wasn't really a market proposition, and he couldn't invest the extra billions required to really put the uh, the plant into, into operation that would be required to, to manufacture it. Great shame, but that's the way things go, I guess. This guy, Elon Musk, the uh, James Bond villain name, is uh, is is the big guy in in EVs these days. Um, Shown on the left-hand side there are the gigafactories uh, that they are putting in, Tesla is putting into, into production. And on the right, SpaceX, another Elon Musk uh, enterprise. Here's a bit of detail here about Elon Musk uh, and Tesla. So Tesla now have factories, several factories in the USA and also uh, in China, in Shanghai, China. And uh, currently, this very, this very moment, um, putting into use a, um, a gigafactory in Berlin. I think it's gonna come on stream in the middle of this year. It very, very, it all happening very, very quickly. Okay, so, uh, I'm just trying to remind myself what this slide is about. Okay. Um, how is, Range, the range is, is a big factor with lithium, lithium vehicles. And the question is, how is it measured? Well, it's measured generally in a laboratory on a dynamometer. So it's not measured on the road. Um, and there are several different standards by which the, the range is measured. This almost always results in a fairly optimistic uh, range figure. And it, it's, it's worth looking at reviews of each individual car because uh, when they're driven on the road, the, the figures come out quite different, probably some more like two thirds of the, um, the labor laboratory figure is, is, a, is a realistic figure. The extreme performers in the area really are, and this, if you look at the, the amount of energy that's required to push a vehicle along the road, you know, a kilometer or whatever. Um, the, the extreme performer is this one, it's the Aptera. It's a company in California uh, and it's called the Solar, sorry, Never Charge, v, ne, sorry. Yeah, the Never Charge uh, Aptera. And the reason is, is you can buy it with uh, solar panels on the roof. And if you only ever do 40 miles a day, as long as you get full sun all day long, you never actually, you'll never have to actually charge the vehicle from the main supply. That's their claim, it, it does up to, um, 10 miles per kilowatt hour, which is uh, which is quite extreme. 
most sorry, it's a three wheel vehicle, three wheel ve three wheel vehicle. I can't say, and um, it has a very very low uh, drag factor. Well, typically, um, a saloon vehicle, as shown below, would have a, um, a laboratory figure, a probably optim optimistic laboratory figure of uh, four miles per kilometer, and sorry, more four miles per kilowatt hour. And um, perhaps if driven very carefully in good weather conditions could deliver up to 2.8 miles per, per kilowatt hour. But as I say, it is careful driving. When we use lithium ion batteries, then the situation really is you, you don't want to be um, using the full range of the battery. If you, if you charge them to 100% and discharge them to 0%, then that does have a habit of, uh, of restricting the, the, the life of the battery. So from day-to-day -day use, the, the way to use the battery to get the most energy throughput through the battery in its whole life is to run between 80% and 20%. And taking the best performer then, which is a, probably a Tesla Model 3 long range vehicle and working on practical mileages, we should be able to do something like 120 miles per day, which is not a bad mileage really for, for most people, considering the average mileage that most people do is about 20 miles a day. So from that point of view, um, you, you could consider an EV to be very practical. Now, a lot of people do more than that, you know, in special circumstances, certain jobs require you to do more than that. But for, for the vast majority of people, such ranges would be very adequate and um, probably deal with things like going on holiday as well. Looking to the future of, uh, of batteries and what's going to happen um, to improve things, Tesla are introducing something called the 4680 battery, which is the 4680 refers to the battery's size. Um, it's a high performance battery um, and it, right, without going into great detail, it, it, its heat performance is particularly good because of the way it's manufactured. And they're going to the proposal is to make into the honeycomb structure I've shown on the, on the bottom left there. Now, interestingly, Tesla are not proposing to make any provision in future in this type of vehicle for, for change of the battery. So that once the car is manufactured with those cells in place, they're part of the structure of the vehicle. And to replace the battery, you would have to take the whole vehicle apart, which obviously will not occur. So, so Tesla's view of the world is that uh, to achieve reliability and low cost, the battery becomes part of the car. Not everybody is taking that view. Another thing you'll hear a lot about is, um, is the solid, uh, solid state battery. This exists in laboratory form at the moment, but um, there are great claims we made for it. Um, company called QuantumScape in the USA are very big in this area, but most other battery manufacturers are looking into it as well. If it meets its um, the claims, then it'll probably be able to double the battery capacity for lithium ion batteries. So that would that would double the figures that we've just seen. So which would make it probably very practical to run a car for 250 miles in a, in a day, which is uh, which would be coming much more towards the what one would expect from a, a petrol engined uh, vehicle. So coming to charging, the thing that um, really strikes me, uh, struck me very, very strongly when I, when I heard this figure, first of all, is that when you go into a petrol station, you put the, the petrol nozzle into the car, the rate of movement of energy down that pipe is around about 12 megawatts. It's a huge, motion of uh, movement of energy, huge transfer of energy. If you look at um, typical charging rates, then for a house, it's more like seven kilowatts. For a fast charger, 50 kilowatts. And for the very fastest chargers, which most cars actually can't actually uh, cope with at the moment, then 350 kilowatts is the ma maximum. So approximately, looking at, comparing the two, even the very fastest electrical chargers are only going at about a 48th or you know 50th roughly at the rate of um, a petrol station. So the net result is that you, 
inevitably are going to be at the station for longer um, and the car will take you know time to charge it, it's just inevitable to, to expect anything much faster than these sort of figures um, 350 kilowatts is a is a huge amount of power to be transferring into a car uh, there we go anyway just very quickly look at the the charging term um, connectors and, and the standards that are used then um, in Europe it's CCS is, is the main one unfortunately CCS doesn't yet include V2G vehicle to grid which I'll talk about later um, it's a shame that it doesn't but uh, but anyway that's that's the way it is and that will come in and as from into the standard as from 2025 the other connectors shown here Tesla's on the right and Chadamo there the second um, from left the Chadamo connector was what was used on Nissan Leaf interesting the Chinese are coming in with a Chadamo 3 type of connect um, interface which does support V2G vehicle to grid um, and will look more like the CCS connector or they, they've swapped the pins around so they're reversed um, so they're not compatible of course so there we go Home charging is probably what we what most of us will do. Two thirds of UK homes, it's reckoned, have a capacity for um, for charging at home. In other words, you can charge. Sorry, you park your vehicle close enough to the main supply to get a cable from the the vehicle to the car. So two thirds of homes come into that category, and home charging is always going to be by far the cheapest way of doing it and you're going to get the longest time so you can go to a sensible rate most home chargers for the vast majority of properties installed now will run at about seven kilowatts and um, I wouldn't expect that to increase much the to increase it above that to 22 kilowatts you'd have to have three phase installed which I, I wouldn't expect except for new build um, properties, which it, it is occurring occasionally. Street charging probably will will be seen. Um, making it relevant to home, we, we I, I know, don't know if it's the same for you and on your streets, but certainly on the, the streets here, the, the lampposts have been put on the inside of the pavement, so which would mean that any if they tried to use that for charging, they would or charging facilities, they would have the cable running over the pavement, which I think would be a bit of a disaster. Um, so perhaps that wasn't a very wise move, but I think that will become more possible, more practical. Um, what we've also seen much more of is fast charging stations. The first one on the right hand side, top right there, is um, a grid serve charging station in Braintree, um, which is which has, it's quite an interesting thing to look at actually. It's got solar power on the roof, it's got a, a major I think it's more four megawatt, uh, sorry, four gigawatt battery. I think if I if remember correctly, um, many charging stations, um, a coffee shop and a car showroom all attached to the same thing. So they expect you to spend time there while you're charging, gives you a chance to go and have a coffee and look at all the new vehicles. Um, that's quite an interesting innovation. Um, only one of those exists at the moment, as far as I'm aware. The bottom one shows the installation, either proposed or which exists at the rugby um, service station. Not sure what, it's certainly coming in if it's not there already. So we will see fast um, charging stations available, um, but probably not 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 quickly in the numbers that you might might want. Actually, if you're trying to find out where to charge, then Zapmap is a very good uh, website which shows you all the charges in the UK. And if you zoom in on on Romsey, then this shows us where the public community charges are around the Romsey area. I know of the one of the Romsey Rapids, and there are several others at other car parks by the look of it. And of course, that those will increase um, probably quite dramatically actually uh, over the next few few years. But um, we shall have to wait and see. Um, there was an announcement this this Monday, last last Monday, about uh, from Off, off Gem. Um, and there were, there were 300 million pounds have been put into the um, of and made available to introduce fast charges at petrol at, at uh, sorry motorway service stations, and also uh, to to reinforce the grid 
because of the, um, the extra power that we'll be pushing through the grid to, to various areas. In addition, there's 40 billion, I'm not sure where this 40 billion comes from or it's going to, but 40 billion is available from Ofgem over the next few years. So that does show that they, you know, big money is moving in this direction. This just looking to the future of charging, then we may see these um, char wireless charging pads. You'd have a similar, similar looking pad on the bottom of the, the vehicle and you drive the vehicle over the top. So there's no, no cable to, to connect one to the other. Um, and that would give a charging rate of up to about 11 kilowatts, I believe, from the uh, from the blurb that I read from, this is a company called Whitricity, which has been in the, the wireless charging, um, very wireless energy transfer really for a long time. Um, I'm a bit dubious about the efficiency of this. I, I had some dealings with it in my working days and I could never get the efficiency much of about 60%, but uh, they've had more time and effort to uh, to make it better than I ever could. This little video here shows an interesting um, setup in China where they're actually replacing the batteries. It's a, it's, a robot, it's a battery replacement robot, really. And you can drive in with a flat battery um, and a minute later drive out with a replacement full battery. Um, this was suggested in the States, but never got anywhere. I guess China has um, the ability to set a national standard and um, not uh, inconvenienced by democracy, <laughs> and um, but they they're moving forward with a with a national um, a chain of national stations you know, to do exactly that. So where's all this power coming from? That's where the, the, the big question. That's the elephant in the room, and so we need to try and answer where now what's going on there. If you simply allow people to charge at random, so you don't control when they charge and how they charge then the, the household energy graph looks very similar. If you look at the shape of the, um, the graphs there, the bottom one is domestic and this one is, is charging. Add the two together, you end up with the top black line. So what people tend to do is they do nothing overnight. They come home, perhaps use it a little bit, use everything a little bit during the day, depending, you know, this is all averaging out over many, many houses. And then the vast majority of people come home from school or home from work and plug everything in. And you get this massive peak here in the evening when everybody's cooking and all the rest of it, the heating's coming on and that sort of thing. That would be disastrous for the grid because a grid has to cope with maximum demand. It's no good having a grid which, um, which can't cope with the peak because what will happen is that essentially the fuse will blow um, in one area and you get a cascade. And this, is, this happens quite frequently in um, in situations in, in power cuts where something causes a trip. Um, so, and then the whole grid cascades. So what, what must happen is that charging, um, sorry, smart charging, I should say, will become the way forward really. And that the effect of smart charging would be to control when people charge. So you plug in regardless and the, the system will automatically then um, control when the power is delivered to the car and how much is delivered to the car. This is the back of an envelope calculation and I'm going to zip through it. So just saying, just trying to figure out roughly how much energy um, the, um, the whole fleet might use. And at a rough estimate, there's 32.7 million cars in the UK or million vehicles. And I've just done a calculation there, which has ended up at something like um, if there was smart charging and the and the charging was, was spread over six hours overnight, then the, the total fleet could be charged at a rate of something like 54.6 gigawatts, which is a huge amount of power, but, but never mind. And the total in a year, remember this figure, the total in a year would be 119.3 terawatt hours of electricity. That's just a very wild finger in the air, just to get some idea of what the what what this what the numbers might be. Um, if we then go to the, the UK dashboard, we can look at the energy consumption. Now, you, actually, this dashboard gives you the um, output of power second by second, really, or minute. Well, over a few minutes, I guess. I suppose um, how much gas we're using, how much wind power we're using, etc. And they also plot the 
um, energy usage over 24 hours. So overnight, we'd have a usage of, you know, this is taken last Monday, we'd, we'd have a typical usage overnight of something like our baseline of 26 gigawatts. If we add on our 54 gigawatts that we worked out in the last calculation, we'd end up with something like 80 gigawatts. And the UK national um, installed supply is, it can actually deliver something like 100 gigawatts flat out. That's it would work, but it's far too close for comfort, really, at the moment. So we, you can see that there's, something's got to happen there to, to make things better. Now, other people, um, one would hope, have done far more detailed studies than this. And, they're, they're, and these are a few documents that I found that were quite helpful to um, try to understand what's going on. Um, the first document looked at the readiness of the UK for, um, for EVs. The last published version that I found was 2018, which still referred to um, 2040 as being the swap over time from when, when you know, um, internal combustion engines would be banned from, from, from new sale. Um, the future energy scenarios was much more recent and quite useful. The uh, energy, UK energy, energy resource, so energy research center, is clearly doing a lot of work, but I couldn't find any publications to, to read from them at the moment, so I'm not quite sure why that was. But anyway, looking at a future energy scenario, you get one of these hideously complicated looking um, diagrams here, but it's, but it's fairly simple. What they're showing is a um, future scenario for energy where the left-hand side shows the generation capacity in various types. And the right hand side shows the consumption. And if you look here, then they're showing road transport of various types, including rail, taking something like 129 terawatt hours per, per year. And if you might remember that, um, I just put that to highlight that fact, the figure that I calculated, my rough finger in the wind, was 119.3 terawatt hours. So I was quite pleased with that. I thought that was, that was as close as one could get from a guess, really. So the key points to take from that, I guess, are that um, we're running a bit short on generation. We need to improve the generation capability. Um, wind power is is probably going to be the way forward from the renewables and in fact the government are uh, proposing to increase that we are currently have 13.75 uh, gigawatt of installed capacity that that will increase to 40 gigawatts by 2050 or sooner i think um, it looks as though there's off gem are looking at um, uh, investing 40 billion or, or more. Um, and probably that will also have to include energy storage to, to, to cope with peak demand. So energy storage, um, I think I cover that in the next slide, if I remember correctly. Yes, okay. If you get a, a very rapid peak demand in a in a grid, it's it, it can take the whole grid down, as I was just as I was saying just a moment ago. So at the moment we have uh, this facility in North Wales, Jorvik. Um, other facilities are likely to come in, and the top diagram there shows um, an installation in Australia, which is a huge battery. It's a, it's called a mega pack. It's a Tesla mega pack, which is a huge lithium ion battery, which means that power can be delivered from that when there's a very rapid peak. You can deliver power in, in really in milliseconds from that sort of installation. The next image down shows uh, an idea for reusing. Um, EV batteries, excuse me. I'll just take a drink of water. The proposal is that when when EV batteries become, um, you know, probably say only half the useful capacity is left, then it could be put into a big facility where they're all controlled by a, a, a central computer uh, control. And, um, and a, and a grid source, a, gr a grid battery could be generated from, from that. So that, that's, that's quite an interesting proposal, I think. The other thing which make quite a big, might make quite a big difference is um, the idea of vehicle to grid. Now, 
the idea there is that if on average, say people only drive 20 miles a day, so the vast majority of people would have a, a considerable excess capacity stored up in their car. And if you go to um, charging, such as Octopus Energy offers, where charging is, is over, I think, a 15 minute um, period in the day, so that um, when energy is cheap, you could charge your car, then as it goes to peak time, you could, the energy could be taken from the car back into the grid via an inverter on the wall, uh, much like your solar system, perhaps you already have at home. And, um, and you could sell energy back into the grid, and then you could, and then you could then recharge it when, when energy is cheap. So that is a, it, it's, it's bandied about quite a lot, although it's not commonly available. I believe the, um, as I said earlier, the, the CHAdeMO um, interface is, is V2G ready, but the, the CCS one, which has been in, uh, adopted in Europe is not, and, it, and it's going to come in, um, approximately 2025 sorry 2025 into the into the new standard ccs but it does mean that um currently installed chargers won't be it won't be compatible with that system there are lots of other energy storage systems that have been proposed i think compressed air there's been um actually someone's proposed they should usually wind a big weight up and down inside a mine um heat uh, hydrogen energy storage all sorts of other things have been proposed which I, I really haven't got time to cover at the moment the feeling i get myself is that um with the the government saying we'll we'll cut to 20 to 78 percent of what's sort of cut by 78 percent um our greenhouse gas emissions by 2035 we're, we're going really too quickly it, it's the right raised rate for what's required for um, the world, but but it's gonna be very difficult to go that fast in terms of the uh, investment and the, the, the improvement of the installed, installed capacities and uh, you know all the uh, infrastructure really. But um, so I, it just made me think of this cartoon, which I, I thought well, amused me anyway. Finally, one might hope that if the, the cavalry comes riding over the horizon sometime in the not too distant future, that nuclear fusion might come into play. Unfortunately, nuclear fusion has been 30 years away for at least the last 30 years, and really not, not much is different. The, the large ITAR plant shown on the um, right-hand side there is in construction at the moment in France, and it's believed that um, this, this plant may be the first one that shows some promise. It's, it, they think that size is important and that the, um, the loss of energy will be much less because at the moment, energy is lost from the, uh, the, the, the plasma into the, the sides of the, the torus uh, rather too quickly. So it's hoped that that might uh, improve. Interestingly, there are some also some um, private companies coming into the the fusion market, I guess they've got sort of skunk groups who are looking at this. If anybody cracks it, they are going to make an absolute fortune. And a lot of people say really that this, we, we have to crack this to for the human race to survive. And I, I kind of agree in the way that we just need plentiful energy. If this becomes a reality, then hydrogen becomes easy because you've got plentiful energy and you can convert the energy into hydrogen. So I think we've got there. It's the end of my talk. So. Thank you for listening and I hope it wasn't too long.